Welcome to Rama. I'm Arthur C. Clarke. We're about to enter a gigantic cylinder that has suddenly arrived in our solar system from the depths of space. Whatever intelligence launched Rama on its interstellar journey demands technologies we humans can barely imagine. Does this intruder from the stars pose a threat to Earth? You are now an astronaut sent to replace a colleague who mysteriously died only hours after a crew of 12 humans made their initial rendezvous with Rama. Your mission is to enter and explore this artificial world and uncover its secrets for humanity. Inside Rama, you and the other astronauts will encounter an astonishing world filled with architectural and engineering marvels, including intelligent machines. Mixed among these alien wonders are complex puzzles and tantalizing clues that offer a glimpse of the extraterrestrial beings who constructed this gigantic hollow world. Will you meet the Ramans themselves? Ah, I don't want to spoil your fun. But I personally guarantee that as you unravel the many mysteries inside Rama, you will have an experience unlike anything you've ever known before. Gentry Lee and I are delighted to share with you this unique vision of the Rama universe. We hope that you will find our Rama world as engrossing and compelling as millions of moviegoers have found 2001 a Space Odyssey over the past quarter century. gigantic cylindrical spaceship of unknown origin was discovered hurtling toward our sun. The International Space Agency decided to mount an expedition to explore this enigmatic messenger from another world. Twelve carefully selected astronauts trained for years for this rendezvous with the alien ship named Rama. its initial sortie into the dark and hollow interior of Rama, astronaut commander Valery Borzov mysteriously died following a routine medical procedure. You are to replace Borzov. The mission commander, Dr. David Brown, will give you specific assignments, but your general mission is straightforward. Explore Rama. Discover as much as you can about the origin and purpose of this intruder from the stars. Hi, bonjour. I am Nicole Desjardins, the medical officer. I hope that your shuttle ride over was uneventful. For all of us here, I would like to welcome you to Rama and let you know that we really need your help. This is the hub site. Your arm computer should be located in your locker over there. As I'm sure you know, it is our most critical piece of equipment. You'll need it to read all the data cubes and the crew member vid mail. Speaking of vid mail, the hub site computer against that wall contains introductory vid mail for you from each of the other crew members. They're all eager to say hello. I guess that covers the critical things. 
It's really dark down here inside this hollow cylinder, which makes the work a little bit more difficult, but we're all getting used to it. Meanwhile, everyone else is busy working inside Rama, installing the remaining infrastructure and discovering new and fascinating artifacts. Right now, I'm going to take the cable car back down to my work site. Why don't you just stay here for a while and look around? You can check out the hub site and your equipment, and then come and join us. Au revoir. Again, Nicole told me that you had arrived. Welcome to Rama. Say, would you do me a favor, just a little one? I left my cigarette lighter up there in my locker. Would you bring it with you when you come down and leave it at the tent site? I'd really appreciate it.
Yerishai, welcome to Rama. We are all delighted to have you join us on this incredible expedition. I am Dr. Shigeru Takagishi, one of the two scientists on the Rama mission. When I was a boy, I looked up at the night sky filled with stars and wondered how many different kinds of life and intelligence might exist in our vast universe. I decided then, as a child, to spend my life learning about the physical and biochemical processes that somehow produced human beings out of a nebular cloud of dust. As you can imagine, my being selected for the Newton team was a thrill and honor beyond my wildest dreams. I am eagerly looking forward to working with you. If I can help you in any way, please call. Welcome aboard, astronaut. ISA officials told me that you've been thoroughly briefed on the goals and progress of our expedition. Good. Because none of us has time to explain a lot of background information. Now, what we need as soon as possible is a contributing team member. We have many more tasks to accomplish than we have resources. In a minute. I'm Dr. David Brown, of course, commander of the Newton mission. Until the untimely death of Valerie Bortsov, I was chief Newton scientist. Now, what I want from you is competence and initiative. People with our experience and training shouldn't need molly coddling or to be told to do something more than once. If you have any routine questions about what's going on, talk to Nicole Desjardins. She's the chief medical officer and has the most free time of the crew. Hello, and welcome to the team. As I'm sure you know, I'm Francesca Sabatini, vid journalist for the Newton Project. I file the Daily Rama report for the IBC News Feed, plus cover our major developments live. To say that the people on Earth are fascinated by what we are discovering here would be the understatement of the century. They're also very interested in the human aspects of the expedition. I've already done personal profiles on all your astronaut colleagues, so as soon as you're acclimated, I want to chat with you about your background, your personal aspirations, anything of human interest. I hope you have a really good tragedy or scandal in your past. The more exotic, the better. Believe me, my broadcasts are desperate for fresh human interest right now. Unlike some of our colleagues, I happen to like company in the evenings after the work is done. And while I keep my vices in check, I'll never pass up a good party. I also love chess, bridge, backgammon, all the competitive games. Come see me when you feel like it. The more I know about you, the better I can do my job. I am Otto Heilman, Chief Security Officer of the Newton Project. My job is to assess whether the enormous Rama spaceship represents a threat either to the Newton crew or to Earth. In carrying out my orders, I have the assistance of two agents from the International Bureau of Investigation, Yamanaka and Tabori. However, it is unlikely that your paths will cross because your assignments are so different. Please, I ask you to remember one thing. We are engaged in what may be an exceedingly dangerous undertaking. Whoever created this awesome alien ship could be extremely hostile and malevolent. Heilman out. I'm Michael O'Toole, Irishman from Boston, father of four great kids, proud grandfather of nine. With my free time, I study religion, physics, encryption, and number theory. Now, I want you to hear this from me before the other astronauts tell you. As a number theorist, I have a favorite numerical sequence. Did you know that if you take the number 41 and add first two, then four, then six, to obtain the sequence of 41, 43, 47, 53, etc., that the first 40 numbers are all primes and no other similar sequence of that length exists? <laughs> I could hear my wife Kathleen inside my head telling me that rambling on about number sequences is no way to make a fit introduction. 
I want to give you a warm welcome, tell you that among my other duties, I'm codemaster for the crew. The cable car, for example, is activated by the numbers 4143. And that I would love to chat with you when you have more time. Goodbye for now. Well, well, well. So we have a true parvenu joining us in the middle of our mission. Well, that's all right with me. But I must say, I'm actually impressed the ISA sent someone so quickly. Heaven knows we can certainly use your help. And. Discretion is the better part of valor. <laughs> Discretion is the better part of valor. <laughs> oh, 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 sorry. Oh, I'm Richard Wakefield. I'm the chief tech engineer on this team. My job is to know how every piece of engineering equipment works. My passion is Shakespeare, as well as electronics, which suggests I should now introduce you to Falstaff here, one of my best creations. <coughs> I have more of these guys in my menagerie, and I've even created one for you. Jones! Mistress quickly must be calling! <laughs> the bard wrote many great words, my friend, and some might even have been designed with you in mind. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Like it or not, you are going to be famous. And if you can do something even a little outstanding, you'll probably never need to work again. But it won't be easy. So, to keep you from screwing up, I offer you the talents of the mischievous Puck, who's hiding in my locker here, and whom I will now summon for you. Puck, you can come out now. Puck! Hello. I'm Reggie Wilson, the writer and journalist representing all the print media on this crazy expedition. Welcome aboard. Though, after what happened to Commander Bortsoff, I think I should wish you luck. I have to tell you, this trip hasn't turned out the way I expected. Most of our key questions remain unanswered. For instance, we still have no idea who built the giant Rama spaceship or what the hell it's doing here. If you ask Dr. Brown, our scientific genius, he'll pontificate for hours but he can't answer the question. Well, I need to interview you in the next day or two, if possible. Everyone on Earth is familiar with the rest of the crew, thanks to our ambitious colleague, Ms. Sabatini, who I'm sure is already beginning to hound you. Nicely, of course. Anyway, save some fresh copy for me, too. And listen, give me a call if you want to share a beer or two. It could be pretty damn lonely up here. Hello. I am astronaut Arina Turgenev from Kiev in the Ukraine. A career service officer, I have flown and completed 14 space missions, including a two-year stint on Much Station on Mars. I want you to know, nothing in my experience has even remotely prepared me for this project. Frankly, I have the feeling there is something sinister about this great, dark, hollow cylinder from nowhere. I felt this even before Valery Borzov died and now my feelings have intensified. However, this is not the proper introduction for a new member of our crew. What I wanted to do is to welcome you and to give you a few words of advice. I must tell you, be wary of both Dr. Brown and reporter Sabatini. You should know they have their own agendas, different from the rest of us. So, if you want any other words of wisdom, please call me. Hello again. At least I hope it's again. Dr. Brown has told me that I am to be your official greeter, but I decided to record this vid mail just in case. As I'm sure you know, I'm the chief medical officer of the crew. That means that I am both doctor and pharmacist, so if you ever need aspirin or any other medication, simply give me a call. I realize that it is difficult to join the team in the middle of a mission, especially one like this with so many extraordinary individuals. Now, I don't want to be pushy, but if I can help in any way, or if you want to talk about anything, just let me know. As you perform your exploration tasks in Rama, I'll drop by from time to time to chat and to see how you're doing. 
Of course, if you have any health problems, please call immediately. Even if I'm not in the vicinity, I can at least guide you to the med packs that we stashed about. Well, take care and see you soon. Yes, indeed, I'm Puck. Or more accurately, you're Puck. I was created by Master Wakefield to be your guide. But not your conscience, I hasten to point out. Truth be told, I enjoy mischief and adventure far more than your average elf. I've been programmed with all sorts of fascinating information gleaned from our initial sorties into Rama. I also possess a special multi-wave receiver that permits me, on your behalf, to pick up transmissions of many different kinds. I am, in a phrase, entirely at your service. If you wonder where your puck is, you need only search your pocket. I am, in a phrase, at your service. It is a voice-activated lock that Richard Wakefield installed. I do not understand the purpose of this device, but it appears to be of human construction. This is the hub camp. The lab equipment was used by the science team to analyze the various artifacts that were found. This computer terminal was here for the convenience of the scientist while constructing the base camp. 
it is now used solely as a relay between the hub camp computer and the astronauts wrist computers. The tent site was constructed as a temporary base camp for the astronauts to use during their explorations. This computer terminal was here for the convenience of the scientist while These are storage units for small items. The tent site was constructed as a tent. These are the refrigerator is used for storing temperature sensitive samples if any are found. Those idiots. They may be brilliant, but they certainly aren't smart. Oh, hello. I, I didn't know you were down here already. Uh, hey, wasn't it a shock when the lights came on? It nearly scared me to death. I I just stood there for several minutes and stared at everything. What a place. You're probably wondering what I am doing with this. Brown and Wakefield think we are going to capture an alien. <laughs> yes, really. Can you imagine it? I just hope the Ramans or whoever created this damn place don't decide to capture us instead. Dr. Takagishi had a word for our attitude. He told me last night, after Brown overruled his objection to the hunt, that our leader and chief engineer both suffer from hubris. <laughs> at least. At the very least. These compartments are for sleeping. The base camp tent was constructed as a temporary shelter. Again, how are you doing? Isn't this a fantastic place? Every time I see something new, I wonder about the beings that created the spaceship. I was just over at the tent site, talking with Richard Wakefield. He was showing me a couple of items that Michael O'Toole had found and left there. One of them was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It still amazes me. Here we are inside of an extraterrestrial spaceship, carrying on a normal conversation. What an astounding life. Oops. Looks like Dr. Brown needs me. I've got to get going. I hope to see you soon. Oh, hi. I'm glad you're here. Otto asked me to leave this computer card in the tent site, and I'm on telecast deadline. Thank you so much. I'll see you later.
that appears to be a temporary rubbish bin. An ancient device that resembles a cannon. It appears to be missing some pieces, so it is probably useless. A sad state of disrepair. Tisk tisk. Did you see that? A pigeon from hell. A buyout of some sort that has obviously been in disrepair for a long time. That cable is too strong to cut with that. The active machinery is resisting your effort. I believe this is a distillation mechanism. I believe this is a distillation mechanism. I detect an empty space inside the hub of this structure and an opening facing us. A doorway at the end of that spoke. A small room is visible above the monitor.
This cube appears to be made from some alien plastic. However, there appears to be something embedded in it. Oh, hi. Francesca and I call this thing a trash biot. It's part of a giant refuse system we've been investigating and documenting ever since the lights came on. The garbage men, the ones who pick up the trash, are the crab biots, those bizarre green and white creatures moving around Rama and the bowling pin formations. I can't believe our esteemed leader thinks we're actually going to be able to capture one of those damn things and take it back to Earth with us. Brown, Wakefield, and Turgenev have come up with some elaborate scheme to drop a snare from a helicopter and lift a biot into the air. If you ask me, they haven't done enough safety analysis. Those crab biots look like they could turn pretty damn nasty, and their mouths certainly have enough sharp teeth. Here, take a look at this data cube when you have the time. It has some footage Francesca and I shot of the crabs moving around, picking up garbage and dropping it into bins stationed in front of the trash biots. Every so often, these bins empty into some kind of underground system. So far, we haven't been able to find it. See you around. Take care of yourself and don't stand in front of any of those crab biots. I sense a biological component to these creatures. This biot looks as though it has been locked behind that gate for good reason. I will call it a spider biot. These biots actually appear to be aspirating underwater. They shall henceforth be known as shark biots. Obviously capable of lifting heavy loads, I will name this a crane biot for our computer records. Sharp scissor-like appendages are surrounding this biot's face. It will be designated a crab biot. This biot has a set of different colored lenses around its head. I will designate it as a mantis biot. A machine that resembles a centipede. I will designate it as a centipede biot. There you are. I hadn't seen you for a while. I was beginning to wonder what happened to you. I was on my way back to the tent site with this rectangular piece. It fell off the back of one of those centipede biots as I was watching it go by. Richard says it's one of the keys for the cities, whatever that means. 
Here, it's yours if you can use it. Ah, hello. I wasn't expecting you. I was trying to figure out why the Ramans placed this here. Are they trying to prevent our going in the direction of that large structure over there? At first I thought so, but now I'm not so sure. I think there's a pattern in the way the discharges flow between the two sides. Sorry, I must go. I need it over at the bio capture site. A switch of some sort, probably for the electrical ray. It has a triangular shaped opening in the top. This appears to be a doorway into London.
These boards seem to have spaces for rectangular shaped objects.
I'm sorry, but for security reasons, you're not allowed to continue in this direction. Dr. Brown has designated me to control this access way temporarily. Later in the mission, when our explorations are more complete, this pathway will no longer be verboten. I believe this is a distillation mechanism. The tray looks like it could use a good cleaning. The tray is quite clean now.
those objects seem to be common terrestrial golf balls. Whatever that was, it has disintegrated with age.
A O U E I An elevator with one of those puzzle locks. Confusing, isn't it? <laughs> I was playing with its mate downstairs. The Romans are almost insidiously clever. These machines seem to be some sort of screening process. I haven't a clue yet why we're being screened. Should become clear after we've completed more of our explorations. Still, what I think the Romans are trying to check is if we are numerically literate. And if the same fundamental paradigms apply here as they did downstairs, then it's just a matter of their alien numbers looking different than ours. After you figure out the paradigms, the machines, oh, they really aren't that difficult. Yeah. Oh, if uh, our impatient leader, Dr. Brown, weren't waiting for me outside, I'd stay and give you a hand. But uh, I have complete confidence you'll figure it out. Eventually. Good luck. Those must be alien golf balls.
Those certainly aren't golf balls. Thank you. 
Why are we included here with these aliens? Could they too be passengers on this vessel? An elevator with one of those puzzle locks. There is now a box with three holes in it there. I wonder where that came from. Oh, hello there. Haven't seen you in ages. Look, I found yet another new and fascinating Raman artifact. This one seems to be a lens of some kind. You know, it's neither glass nor plastic. <laughs> Engineering lab's back on Alpha Lava Field Day with it. Still, it's sufficiently translucent enough that I'm sure it is an optical instrument of some kind. Oh, here. Take a look. Oh, damn, someone's always calling for the chief engineer. Got to dash.
don't like the looks of that. Thank God you're here. I've got some bad news and I wanted to deliver it personally. Reggie's been killed. It happened while we were attempting to capture a crab biot. The entire capture attempt was televised live on Earth. Already there are masses of controversy. Dr. Brown is afraid that they might cut our mission short or maybe even terminate it. I'm sorry, but I have to find Arena to tell her too. Francesca has just finished her telecast of the incident with most of the details. It's on this cube. I'm afraid it's a bit strong. I'm sorry, I I've got to go. We'll rendezvous later. This is Francesca Sabatini, reporting again from inside the giant extraterrestrial spaceship called Rama. Less than an hour ago, a second tragic astronaut death occurred. The American, Reggie Wilson, the other journalist on the Newton crew, was savagely killed. A few days ago, soon after dawn came to Rama, we first discovered these remarkable mechanical creatures scurrying across the open ground. Mission leader Dr. David Brown quickly determined to capture one for reverse engineering on Earth. A metal snare dropped from a helicopter successfully captured our target. However, as we lifted the crab biot into the air, a second unit attached its pinches to the first and was carried aloft as well. The second dangling crab eventually fell to the ground from a great height and appeared destroyed. I was completely unaware of the fearsome crab's attack until I heard Reggie Wilson shout a warning. As I began to run, Reggie heroically drove one of our rovers directly into the side of the biot. The alien crab completely shredded the rover and everything in it. What does Reggie Wilson's death mean for the Newton expedition? And what does it say about Rama? I talked first with astronaut scientist Shigeru Takagishi. I do not think, Francesca, that the creature intended to hurt astronaut Wilson. It is an intelligent machine, I agree. But in my opinion, not smart enough to distinguish between the rover and its driver. That crab biot believed that it was under attack by the rover and simply defended itself. Dr. Takagishi's point of view is not shared by astronaut Irina Turgenev. To me, there can be no doubt whatsoever. The crab biop deliberately chopped Reggie to bits. In my opinion, we should get out of this place immediately and then blow it to pieces. For IBC, this is Francesca Sabatini reporting from the interior of Rama. Hear ye, hear ye, all ye Newton astronauts who fear that the end of the world is come. I can now confirm from our celestial senses that what we just experienced was some sort of major trajectory correction. Now, we aren't sure yet exactly what our Raman friends are trying to do, but it appears to be another standard maneuver like the one that took place during Borzo's operation. I'll let you know if and when either Misha Control or I figure out what the maneuver was for. Bye-bye for now.
Greetings, everyone. I have just received confirmation from Earth that the quake we experienced not too long ago was, in reality, the Rama spacecraft performing a trajectory correction maneuver. This maneuver, according to the navigation specialists at Mission Control, has now placed our alien spaceship on an impact course with Earth. As you can imagine, this is causing considerable consternation at home. Because of the huge size and hyperbolic velocity of this spacecraft, it has been calculated that its impact would cause a greater cataclysm than the one caused by the comet that struck the Yucatan 65 million years ago, precipitating the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. An emergency meeting of the joint UCGISA Management Council is currently underway to determine what, if anything, can be done about Rama. I've been informed that the ISA director is recommending a variety of actions, one of which is abandonment of the mission. I'll let everyone know when I have any more definitive information. Meanwhile, gather as much scientific data and as many specimens as you possibly can. Goodbye for now. spoke. Where is that vile beast? He seems to not be at home. that spoke. You're here. I was just about to send you a vid mail. Two hours ago, I was informed that the ISA crisis deliberations on Earth had concluded. We've been ordered to evacuate Rama immediately. Otto and Arena are already at the tenth site determining which specimens and equipment to take with us. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost contact with Takagishi, O'Toole, and Sabatini. They haven't acknowledged the evacuation order. At last contact, they said they had discovered an island city of skyscrapers out in the middle of the ice and were going to explore it. But that was more than three hours ago. Well, we can't just leave them here. Why don't you go back to the tent site with Otto and Arena and we will search for the missing trio. I guess that could work. But don't take too long. 
ISA headquarters wants us out of here in less than 12 hours. This cube contains three vid mails I received from the group after they arrived in New York. It might help your search. Dr. Brown, I need to talk to you about the evacuation. There are some interesting things here at the ice port. Look around for a few minutes and I'll meet you at the ice mobile. David, this place is absolutely magnificent. There are strange looking geometrical buildings, tall skyscrapers. It looks as if some intelligent species may have lived here for years. People on Earth are going to be stunned when they see it. We're going inside the city or fortress or whatever it is now. I'll talk to you later. David, what we have found here is utterly amazing. We've entered the gates of some kind of city and walked down an avenue into a large plaza. And right now I'm standing in a small room off to one side of the plaza looking at what seems to be a set of controls. But for what? The answer certainly isn't obvious. Since we first entered Rama, we've encountered mystery after mystery. And we still haven't met any real Ramans, in my opinion. The biots scattered throughout this vehicle, including here in New York, are certainly not the creators of this vast worldlet. So where are the Ramans? Do they live here in this city? I hope we find them and some of the answers to our questions. It would be unthinkable to leave without some unambiguous answers. That's all for now. I'll check in again in another hour. The three of us have split up temporarily, and we'll meet again in this plaza in 20 minutes. Good. It looks like it's finally working. Dr. Brown, this is the fourth time that I've tried to send a vidmail message since I left that initial plaza and entered the mazes. There must be something here in this walled city that blocks communication. I'm standing in another plaza every bit as amazing as that first one. Skyscrapers surround the open area. There's an octahedron on one side, and colors everywhere. But none of it is as astonishing as what I saw just two minutes ago when I came around the corner of one of the buildings. Some kind of creature was watching me from over there near the edge of the plaza. It was black or dark gray and had long tentacles that it used for locomotion. I only caught a glimpse of it before it disappeared out of the exit. I didn't have much time to observe this creature, but it definitely looked biological. We may finally be meeting the true Ramans. I'll make another report the moment I see it again. A device like the one at the hub camp, but I still do not know what it is. Ah, there's the ice mobile. Come on, let's get going. It may take us a while to find them. The ice mobile has already been programmed to skate us across the ice. The machine's code is another pair of numbers from Michael O'Toole's favorite sequence, 4753. Watch what happens when I enter them. You know, I'm not very comfortable with the idea that we're placing bombs here and there in Rama. I was shocked when I first saw that one at the ice port. But both Otto and Dr. Brown assure me that the bombs are strictly for defensive purposes and will only be used if there's an unambiguous threat to Earth. Still, I can't help wondering what it must look like to the Ramans or whoever it is who's in control of this place. I mean, suppose I showed up to your house for the first time carrying bombs. What would you think of me? That must have been Yamanaka and Tabori. I recognize the ISA uniforms, but not the faces. I wonder what they've been doing. Dr. Brown, this is Nicole. We were just passed by an ice mobile heading towards the ice port. I presume the occupants were Yamanaka and Tabori. If they have any new information about the missing astronauts, please have them contact us immediately. Look at that. 
every bit as fabulous as Francesca claimed. Why don't you go on ahead without me? I want to take a look around in the ice mobile. This entire island is one huge machine. That handle is too high, we can't reach it. Looks like there's something of interest on the ground over there. This represents several of the creatures displayed in Bangkok. Looks like there's something of interest on the ground over there.
That's Michael O'Toole's anniversary photo.
Looks like there's something of interest on the ground over there. That seat was designed to fit the human form. The monitors on the wall appear to be controllable. Perhaps this is a test of some kind. Another chair. This is a console with a large button.
Looks like there's something of interest on the ground over there. I cannot analyze the workings of this device. There is a quarter mile drop below us. The ledges we descended have been retracted.
We saw these strange symbols in Bangkok. That mechanism has jammed. Some of the lights here are failing. The gourd lanterns try to compensate.
This console has not been activated yet. device has failed. My ultraviolet sensors indicate that parts of these murals are painted with materials outside a human's normal visual range.
A caustic liquid fills the pool. This door has been sealed for years. Controls of some type. They are corroded shut. This console has not been activated yet. Oh, thank heaven. I just about given up hope of finding you. Listen, we have to act quickly. Heilman and his lunatics have activated three nuclear bombs which are going to explode in precisely six hours from now, annihilating Rama and everything in it, including us. One of the bombs is somewhere here in New York. We've got to find it and input the disarming code. If we can disarm one bomb, the whole network will shut down. I knew it! <laughs> Another maneuver! I told those damn paranoids Rama wouldn't stay on an impact course. 
I'll bet my life this spaceship no longer poses a threat to Earth. It'll simply pass by close enough for observation. Oh, look, look, this is not the time for polite conversation. If we don't find and disarm that bomb, we are both going to be vaporized. I have to go over to the Piazza with the pentahedron where I crashed the helicopter. I left Nicole there with a sprained ankle. I said I'd be back in a flash. Look, I'm giving you full staff, both as a companion and a good luck charm. He's very clever, if I do say so myself, and, and can sometimes go places you can't. Tell me, Master Wakefield, how do you choose a man? Can I for the limb, the thews, the stature, the bulk, the big semblance of a man? <laughs> Give me the spirit, Master Wakefield. I fitted him with a camera. You can see his pictures now on your arm computer. I think that's everything. By the way, Falstaff doesn't need much instruction, but he only works in special environments. He usually knows what to do when activated. If you have any questions, listen to Puck. Now let's find that bomb. I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend the rest of my life as a set of disconnected subatomic particles. Looks like there's something of interest on the ground over there. The architecture here is extremely fluid and organic. I detected mechanical motion somewhere above. Alien varlets have disappeared. Forsooth, my chance is now. I will across the floor and save the day. <coughs> Once a hero, always a hero. Sirrah, there will be rewards for me. A knighthood and a knight with dull tear sheet.
Hello, darling. I haven't heard from you in over an hour, but I presume you're all right. Look, Francesca, Otto and I have been talking. He believes our security plan could be compromised if O'Toole sees Yamanaka, Taburi, or the bomb. Now, make certain you keep him away from that entire area. Now, Takagishi isn't as dangerous. I don't think he'd ever put two and two together. But O'Toole designed the code. The geezer can probably recite the disarming digits right off the top of his head. Take care of yourself. And get back here quickly. As you know, we've got to leave in 15 hours. No, absolutely not, Miss Sabatini. We can take no risk that O'Toole ever sees the bomb or the crate or even Yamanaka and Tabori. He knows why they're here and would be very suspicious. You must keep him completely away from that area. I explained all of this to you before you left in the ice mobile. General O'Toole is intimately familiar with the bombs and the code structure, and he is also resolutely against taking any kind of preemptive action in this situation. If O'Toole messes up our plans, I will hold both you and Dr. Brown personally responsible. There is too much at stake here. We cannot tolerate any mistake. The nuclear bomb beside me is one of three the Newton carried with her when she left Earth. Only Otto Heilman, Commander Borisov, and Agents Yamanaka That's too and... strong and too personal. Don't mention names and don't say anything about our prior planning. I am standing next to a nuclear bomb, one of three carried by the Newton. These bombs will be set to explode simultaneously, totally destroying Rama long before the alien spaceship can attack our planet. Immediately before the Newton's evacuation, we will activate the bombs with a 20-digit number. The code was designed by Michael O'Toole and initiates a countdown clock. I'm sorry, dear, but that's way too much detail. No, it sounds as if we had planned it all from the beginning. David, we're still filming. Turn it off. Oh, my goodness. I believe that is Miss Sabatini's uniform. I'm afraid she wouldn't have left that willingly. It looks like a stylized octa spider.
the gate's locking mechanism appears to have been deactivated. The numerals from all three levels of Bangkok are on this display. The avian guard from the lair we visited. We've only seen statues of these creatures before now. This picture must be very old. It's a stuffed avian. Another one of those. They've been spying on us. It's Dr. Takagishi, stuffed like a trophy. A picture of an octo spider. I believe we now know what happened to Takagishi. I can identify him from his dental records. That's Michael O'Toole's crucifix. I wonder what it's doing here. That appears to be a symbolic map of some kind. This scarf belonged to Miss Sabatini. It's knotted tight. There is no power to this unit. My senses indicate power in this car, yet it is too small for you to venture into.
this room has an unfinished feel to it. The Romans must have found the bomb and moved it in here. This area seems to have been set up for humans. You. We're up top near that bizarre pentahedron watching what looks to be like some kind of a celebration. At least that's what Richard thinks it is. Get up here as soon as you can. You don't want to miss this. Have you ever seen anything so beautiful? Never. And we're alive because of you. We can't possibly thank you enough. Thanks, Ace. You were great. You are great. 
I guess. Though I can't imagine why it took you so long. So, you saved yourself a pride of octopus spiders, a gaggle of avians, and several herds of biops, as well as a few human beings. Not bad, but a couple of hours' work. A wonderful creature, this avian, but certainly not smart enough to be a spacefarer all by itself. Its symbiotic colleague is actually much more intriguing. This bizarre centipede, like its other colleagues in the game, is a biological robot. Though it's made of living material, it's still a robot. But can machines really think somewhere out there, I'm certain, are machines whose intelligence far surpasses ours? Maybe a machine even built Rama in the first place? Hmm, now that's a fascinating idea. You see, it agrees with me. Maybe you figured that these octo spiders are also passengers on this mysterious spacecraft. They have no more idea where Ram is going than we do. The Octos have extended their influence through a vast region containing hundreds of stars. Yet Ram hasn't yielded up its secrets, even to them. Where did you come from, Ram? Why are you here? And where are you going? This huge spacecraft is now hurtling out of the solar system at cosmic speed. Its destination, like its origin, utterly unknown. On board are several human beings, as well as biots, aliens, and a host of other fascinating creatures. In the not too distant future, you'll have another chance of visiting Rama to see proof of my third law. Any advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So join us again for a second Rama adventure somewhere out there among the stars. Oops, sorry about that. I hope you aren't upset because we've killed your alter ego, the replacement astronaut. We just wanted to remind you that there are some dangers inside Rama. Take this fellow, for example. Although he's just a garbage collector, you'd better keep out of his way. That stuff in his mouth is pretty scary. As biots go, this one's not too bright. You could even mistake one of us a piece of trash 
in which case would be carried to a trash biop like this one and would end up in the Rama dump. The crab biop takes up anything it considers to be trash. Nothing remains on the ground in plain sight for very long. Don't be discouraged. Rama is a wonderful place to explore and that's what you should be doing. But explore carefully. Look at every item. Try to figure out why the Ramans put it there. And of course, have fun. And please, don't die every hour or so. Oops, sorry about that. I don't like the looks of that. Tut tut, I must say, I'm surprised to see you. I thought we made it absolutely clear that these spider biots are dangerous. Programmed to be an assassin. The Ramans deliberately created it to deal with equally nasty creatures. On guard! I wouldn't try that if I were you. First of all, you don't have a cane, and of course, you're not immortal. My advice, stay away from all spider biots in Rama, unless you have a cane, or maybe a crane. Perhaps you have not understood what I said. This area is off limits to you. You cannot proceed in this direction. Now turn around and go back the way you came. Or I will notify Dr. Brown and I warn you, he will not be happy with your behavior. What the hell do you think you're doing? Now, Otto told me you ignored him and are now committing a serious breach of security. And let me make this crystal clear, Ace. Unless you turn around now and head in the opposite direction, you'll be fired for insubordination and removed from Rama immediately. You got that? Now turn your butt around and do what you're told. You just had to push, didn't you, Ace? Well, my friend, you've now crapped in your mess kit and ruined what looked like a promising career. I wasn't bluffing. You are hereby fired and ordered to leave Rama immediately. Lucky for us, none of us will ever have to see you again. Light. Oops. Dreadful, wasn't it? And yet being close to a real nuclear explosion would be much worse. In my life, our entire world was changed by the existence of bombs like this. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, nuclear weapons a thousand times more powerful were built, giving us, for the first time, the ability to destroy ourselves. So would it be surprising if the events in this Rama game really occurred in the future? If a gigantic alien spacecraft, its origin and purpose totally unknown, was indeed on an impact course with Earth, wouldn't humanity decide that it must be destroyed? In this game, 
you can prevent the destruction of Rama. To do this, you have to figure out a few numbers and apply them in a specific way. And when you've done that, you'll be a true hero. Because of your actions, the remaining astronauts on board Rama, the weird and wonderful octo spiders and avians, and the entire menagerie of biots will all survive. And as for you, well, you just might have a chance to see me again and learn what's in store for the inhabitants of this spacecraft as it heads out into the universe. I'm not going to show us her or Pepsi, but you know, I suddenly one day, sometimes Pepsi's my best girl, sometimes. <laughs> the children have a lot of exposure to people that normally they wouldn't, and also he's taken us on many trips that normally we would not have been able to go on. Um, and not only that, just in his his world. I, mean, I always say that we orbit in the Clark orbit. <laughs> we, we do. <laughs> you know, this house always just moves. And, and if you're in this house, you're definitely in the Clark orbit. He's all the time is coughing, you know. And then I took to, you know, uh, to England to find out what it is. Then the doctors said that he was suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease. And then I immediately decided to take him to the United States, to John Hopkins. We were waiting for the doctor to come with the result. And when the doctor mentioned that he's not suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease, it's only a a post polio syndrome, Arthur was very, very happy, you know. We all was very happy. And we don't know how happy we were. You can't imagine, you know. To a man who told about two years he's going to finish his life, and here he come and says it's nonsense, you know. When people ask me this question, often the quick answer I give is, why do you live in, in Sri Lanka? I answer, 30 British winters.
the Ramans deliberately created it to deal with equally nasty creatures. On guard. Cat. To deal with equally nasty creatures. On guard. Okay, Miss Makeup. Uh, I'm, I'm, this is not my forte, but I'll learn. That's it. It's all stuff you learn. Okay, I wonder which is here. It's actually much wonder. It is nine feet tall, and it's right here next to you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do I look scared or am I intrigued? You're not, you, you, no. you look like you would look. You look like you. <laughs> A wonderful creature, this avian. Crab bio picks up anything it considers to be trash. Nothing remains on the ground in plain sight for very long. Crab bio picks up anything it considers to be trash. Nothing remains on the ground in plain sight for very long. Well, you see, I ended Rendezvous with Rama with the phrase, the Ramans do everything in threes. Now, a lot of people thought that I was th heading for a sequel then, but I, for years I said, no, no, I just felt that was the right way to end the book. I will never write a sequel to Rendezvous with Rama. But then, <clears throat> when this guy came along, he had one or two ideas about engineering and so forth, you know. <laughs> I realized, hmm, yes, if I want to develop this further, and after all, if the Ramas do everything in threes, there may be two more coming, or maybe one's already come. Anyway, the possibilities are there, and so you know, let's look into it. And one thing led to another, and another, and another. Right. I got a letter from my agent um, saying that there was someone who had some idea for a science fiction story, and he wanted to work with me. Well. I said, no way, I have too many ideas of my own. And then he said that he was involved with the Galileo project, the space probe to Jupiter. And of course, I've been very interested in Jupiter because Jupiter was the scene of much of the action in the Odyssey series. And so I said, oh yes, and I'd like to see this fellow. And so he said, okay, so, you know, at least it won't do any harm to talk to him. I might get some good ideas from him. The most important thing that I have learned from Arthur is the precision of the English language. I tend to be verbose and to, to use five words where two or three will do. And there's some that will argue that all I've done is figure out how to only use four, and I'm still too verbose. But it's been a great experience for me to watch the felicity he has with the English language. Yes, I'm not quite sure how I do feel. In fact, one of the criticisms of this kind of interactive adventure is that, well, it's not what the original author created. I mean, would you like Hamlet with a happy ending, you know? <laughs> well, may, or maybe it's, it'd be interesting at least. But what I hope this sort of thing will do will educate people. It'll make them realize, in, in the case of the drama series, the scope of the universe, the the fact that we are probably not alone, it will teach them and stretch their minds. And that's why I like this particular development. I'm very much against the violent stuff and, you know, another Martian bit the dust kind of thing. At least we're, anything that gets clobbered in our, in our adventure it deserves to be clobbered. <laughs> In the past, it hasn't, but now that I have been through this extraordinary experience of trying to blend a story and gameplay, which is what we're trying to do in Rama, neither one ascendant, good gameplay, good story, wrapped together in a literary form, I now think that most of my novels in the future will be shaped by the fact that there is another medium that may reach more people. Again, what Arthur said earlier, the good feature of having science fiction done as on a computer is that there will be many more people who will know the story. 
than there might be if we just were limited to the single medium of writing books. I said, what is that? <laughs> Remember, I haven't seen any of these new multimedia, whatever you like to call them, with a very few exceptions, and I really had no idea of what was involved, and I'm extremely impressed now with what I have seen. I don't think I ever imagined I would become a professional author. I wrote entirely for fun uh, in the school magazine in my late teens, and later on, amateur science fiction magazines made a few dollars here and there. And then I got a job, a very good job in the Institution of Electrical Engineers, editing science abstracts and getting all the world's scientific magazines to abstract and but I was still writing, you know, in my spare time. And uh, what happened was that my salary, the trend years went like that, my salary or my income as a science fiction writer went up like that and at the crossover point I just resigned. And it was a very, I, no hassle, no problems. I published a number of novels, Sands of Mars, of space uh, from a small press, Gnome Press, but I think the first six real success was certainly with Childhood's End when Ballantyne took it and it got very good reviews including New York Times and so that was my first commercial and indeed a critical success outside the science fiction ghetto. Well, science fiction is an extrapolation, usually, of known science, or at least plausible science. And incidentally, science fiction does not, as many people think, try to predict the future, but it does try to predict perhaps the technological future, you know, what might be possible if certain scientific uh, fields are developed further, or maybe if new branches of science are discovered. Well, if I was about 50 years younger, I think I probably would. Well, it's absolutely clear what I would do. Uh, I, 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 I like the avians, but very quickly I would determine that uh, they were not more advanced than the human species. The octospiders would fascinate me. I would see the colors streaming around their heads. I would want to speak to them in their language. I would want to understand where they came from, how they evolved, what their past history was, what their goals were, what their values were. And all of that would be where I would go. So if I were to be on board, the commander of the, of the crew would have a hard time keeping me from finding out what that was all about. Well, there's so much to look for. It's, you, you, you really aren't looking, you're just discovering new wonders. You're not looking for anything specific. Uh, because everywhere there's something new that you've never even thought of. I'm sure we'll be going back to the moon with much better and safer and more economical spacecraft early in the next century. But the real action is going to be on Mars, maybe 2020 or there onwards. As space travel becomes easier and safer and cheaper, we will inevitably go out to the planets. But we have to wait for improvements in technology. And when they come along, whether the will is there or not, we'll go. But we've just quite recently had another very good reason for going into space. The whole world watched when Jupiter was clobbered by Shoemaker-Levy. Now we know this happened in the past. It's happened many times in the history of our Earth. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs were probably made extinct, or they may be on the way out anyway, but that impact 65 million years ago finished off the dinosaurs. And as my friend Larry Niven once said, the reason why the dinosaurs became extinct was because they didn't have a space program. Well, I'm afraid it's a little too late now. I don't even, li I don't even like going in airplanes anymore, I'm afraid. But um, I guess uh, it's going to take a long time to get to Mars, um, six, six or eight months at the, at, on the minimum orbit, isn't it? Right. So uh, no, 
I'm afraid I couldn't face that sort of thing. But if a flying saucer landed and said, I'll take you to Office and Tory, uh, that's another thing. <laughs>
and use it to run our machines or whatever, or our spacecraft. This would open up the universe and it would give us an almost infinite source of energy. And that would be the end of the fossil fuel age, the end of uranium and the nuclear age. It would solve our pollution problems, the carbon dioxide buildup. It would change our world out of all recognition more than anything, perhaps, since the discovery of fire. One of the reasons why I'm interested in this infinite energy, uh, the, the phrase coal fusion is rather passe, and it may not be fusion at all, is because if this is for real, and I'm now 95% convinced that it is, this will open up the universe, because it would give us essentially weightless power. The problem with rockets, our only means of propulsion in space, is we need gigantic quantities of fuel to carry a tiny payload. But if this infinite energy works, and if, as is possible, it might even provide a method of propulsion, then the universe is going to open up just as the sailing ship opened up the world. You can't beat the laws of thermodynamics. Everything degrades to heat. Where's the heat going to go? Venus, here we come, <laughs> Nine, six, 500 degrees in the shade. Well, I'm sure there will be a technological solution to that. The 2001 was written and appeared at a unique moment in human history. It was released before the first men had landed on the moon, in fact, before the first flight around the moon. And, of course, we had to guess what things would be like there. On the whole, we did pretty well, although we had much too jagged lunar landscapes. You know, that was a tradition. And of course, now it's obvious that the moon is pretty well sandblasted, so it's smoother. And it's interesting to know the notice of things that we got right and the things that we got wrong. Who would have dreamed that the Bell system and, and Pan Am were no, long, were no longer with us? But uh, Hilton is still around. <laughs> Now, um, the other thing we had to guess was what it would be like on the moons of Jupiter, which were just points of light in, any, in the most powerful telescope then. And it wasn't, of course, until the Voyager missions went there that we got close-ups of, the, of these fantastic places. And uh, well, it, we didn't do too bad even there, I think. No, you did fairly well. <laughs> no one could have predicted Io. Right. I mean, no th one. that was just uh, staggering. After this lapse of time, I can no longer say what ideas were mine and what ideas were standing, with a few exceptions. Uh, some of the basic ideas came from stories of mine, particularly of the Sentinel, which is a very short story about the discovery of a fire alarm, if you like, on the moon, set there by some alien race to alert the universe when we've reached the moon. And this is an idea which has been taken quite seriously, and it has been suggested there may be such alarms, perhaps not on the moon, but in the asteroid belt which you may trigger when we get there. Well, that was my idea. But then we embroidered so many concepts, and, you know, bat like a table tennis game, we were batting ideas back and forth, and 90% of them were probably bad, and of the 10% that survived, probably half of Stanley's and half mine. When 2001 was released early in 68, and it's already had its 25th anniversary, which I can't believe. At first, everyone thought it was a disaster. I can remember at the Washington premiere, one of the MGM executives saying, well, that's the end of Stanley Kubrick. And in fact, the first reviews were lukewarm or even critical. And then, of course, the critics went back and saw it again and changed their minds. But there was a slow ground swell. It took a couple of weeks before the message got around and we realized, you know, probably within a month, that we did have something exceptional on our hands. This is what happens when I switch off my computer. My mind is going. I can feel it. Good evening.
This is Francesca Sabatini reporting for IBC from the ISA training facilities, where the Newton astronauts are undergoing their final tests for the historic rendezvous with the gigantic extraterrestrial spaceship called Rama. Tonight and for the next two nights, I'll focus on the other extraordinary men and women who will represent mankind on this landmark mission. First, among the Newton astronauts are two of the world's top research scientists, Dr. David Brown and Dr. Shigeru Takagishi. These men have spent their entire careers trying to understand how life and intelligence developed on Earth and what that paradigm might mean for the nature of alien life forms. How many people know where they really came from? Does the public actually understand that the iron, magnesium, and other heavier elements in their body were created in the death throes of stars billions of years ago? Every living thing on Earth owes its existence both to the presence of those heavier elements in the Earth's nebula at the time of its formation and to the remarkable evolutionary process that produced us. When people ask me if I expect to meet aliens that look like little green men, I usually laugh. If we encounter any aliens, they will certainly be far more fantastic than our wildest imaginings. And the chances that they will resemble us in any way are exceedingly remote. In the billions of galaxies in our universe, I believe that chemicals like us have evolved to consciousness on many planets. But only here on planet Earth do we know for certain that those chemicals are aware of themselves and can ask questions about their origin and destiny. To encounter another being at the same or more advanced level of sentience will be the single most important event of human history. Dr. Brown's research area is chemical evolution, so it's natural for him to view life as nothing more than the gaudy result of chemical reactions. Dr. Takagishi, on the other hand, takes a distinctly anthropological approach to alien life forms. We are about to interact with a civilization that has existed millions of years longer than we have. Please think about what this means. <laughs> it doesn't matter, as I have told astronaut Heilman, if the Ramans are friendly or hostile. They are so far ahead of us that any resistance to them will be futile. If their technology can build, launch, and operate an interstellar spaceship the size of our largest cities, how can we presume that our puny capabilities could stop them from doing whatever they choose? Personally, I am completely certain that the Ramans will be friendly. Doctors Brown and Takagishi, like the rest of the astronaut crew, know full well the heavy responsibility they carry. For IBC, this is Francesca Sabatini at the Newton Training Facility. Good evening, and welcome back to the ISA Astronaut Training Facilities. Tonight, I talk to the three career space officers who will travel with the Newton mission when it investigates Rama early next year. Well, the Newton astronauts will carry two versions of this uniform up to Rama. One model, which I'm not wearing tonight, will fit over our spacesuits for use in physically hostile environments. The other, this one, will wear inside the Newton and in other benign locations. The most important feature of the uniform and our most important piece of equipment is the arm computer. Also a communications device, we'll use it to transmit and receive vidmail messages from the other astronauts. And one of those other astronauts is Richard Wakefield. Wakefield is a quintessential systems engineer. He has no peer in the astronaut corps. Richard, can you explain for us non-technological people just what is a systems engineer? Suppose an engineering team were given the task of designing a human being. Now, undoubtedly, they would employ specialists to uh, create such complex subsystems as the heart, the brain, the liver, etc. But someone would have to ensure that the total person could function, uh, that each of the parts could be integrated and together produce a working human being. That's the systems engineer's job. Thank you, Richard. We know how busy you are, and we appreciate your taking the time to talk with us. 
working with Richard Wakefield. Excuse me, Francesca, uh, but I believe I have another function on this project, one that may be of even greater importance than my nominal tasks. And that is? It's clear. We are going to encounter some absolutely mind-boggling technology. Technology that for all intents and purposes is, is indistinguishable from magic. I can't wait to see this engineering magic firsthand and, and attempt to figure out how it works, what it means, and, and, and what it says about the intelligence that created it. Yes, well, that's it, I guess. Thank you, Richard. Richard's two ISA colleagues are both women. Engineering specialist Irina Turgenev and chief medical officer Nicole Desjardins. Yesterday, astronaut Turgenev had just finished testing the new flight rover when I caught up with her. She once said that she was married to the ISA and had no time or desire for any other life. Sometimes, after a mission, I return home to Kiev to visit my parents. I look around and I wonder if I have missed something important. I have no husband, no children, no life outside the ISA. My work is my life. It has been worth it, though. I have seen the fury of dust storms on Mars. I have seen the glory of the Earth rise from the moon and a, a fiery volcano on Io from a distance of only 10 kilometers. And now I am to be part of the most important mission humans have ever undertaken. I admit I am frightened about what we may find, but I wouldn't trade my position with any other woman in the world. I've just been informed that Dr. Desjardins is now available to talk to us. Good evening, Nicole. Can you tell us what you've been doing today? Certainly, Francesca. I've just finished a series of tests on the new robotic surgical equipment that we'll be taking with us on the Newton. As you know, since I'm the only doctor on the crew, computers and robots must be my assistants in any complicated procedure. Is everything working correctly? Not yet, but that's normal. We still have several more months to iron out the bugs. Nicole, are you at all worried about the medical equipment being ready by flight time? Not at all. My concern, Francesca, is that we may have a major medical emergency while we're exploring Rama. That would obviously present challenges. Due to weight restrictions, we can only carry limited amounts of diagnostic equipment. And while our robotic support is excellent, some of the newest devices haven't been exhaustively field tested. Do you anticipate excessive levels of stress due to the unusual nature and high profile of this project? My primary psychological concern has always been using an inexperienced crew on a long duration mission. Career astronauts like Turgenev and Wakefield are low risk in any kind of space mission. Um, they've performed similar situations throughout their entire careers. It's the five neophytes who worry me. Well, as one of those neophytes who has been training for over two years now, let me ask you what it would take to alleviate your concerns. Please forgive me, Francesca. It's my duty to worry about the what-ifs. You and Reggie Wilson and the scientists will try to understand and interpret what you find at Rama. My primary task is simpler. Reduce the probability of untoward health events to the lowest possible level. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must... Of course, Dr. Desjardins. Well, that wraps up our show for tonight. I hope that you'll be back with us tomorrow evening for our final segment on the crew of the Newton. Until then, for IBC, this is Francesca Sabatini. Good evening. This is Francesca Sabatini once again at ISA Training Headquarters. Tonight, I'm joined in our studios by my fellow journalist astronaut on the Newton mission, Reggie Wilson. First, we'll speak with Admiral Otto Heilman, security chief for the Newton mission, who is currently at his home in Berlin. Then, our guest will be General Michael O'Toole, the military man whose entire career has been spent negotiating peace instead of waging war. Good evening, Admiral Heilman. Actually, it is already good morning here in Berlin. Many people have asked me why we have such a strong military presence on the Newton mission. Are we really worried that Rama represents some kind of a threat? Francesca, although we haven't seen any hostile or threatening behavior from Rama to date, I believe that its mere existence ought to frighten every human on this planet. Whatever the Raman's intentions, 
They have technological capabilities far beyond our own. They have built a city-sized spacecraft and dispatched it across the stars. Their military potential is absolutely staggering. Then you don't agree with Dr. Takagishi's belief that a species so advanced couldn't be hostile? As a security specialist, I would not need much indication that Rama was hostile to justify destroying it completely. Thank you for your time, Otto. Reggie and I will see you next week at the Florida Spaceport. Hello there, General. How are things in sunny Italy? It wasn't so sunny today, Reggie. In fact, I got a little wet waiting in line at the monument of St. Michael of Siena. <laughs> Ciao, General O'Toole. This is Francesca. I just received a report that you spent most of the morning in a private audience with the Pope. Is this true? And if so, what did you and His Holiness talk about? Most of it wouldn't be of interest to the general public. Fine points of church doctrine. We did discuss some more general religious issues, however. For example, if there are intelligent extraterrestrials, have they too fallen from God's grace? Do they need Jesus or the equivalent to redeem them? And if so, is the Christ paradigm repeated on every world where there's intelligence? And if not, why do some species require redemption and others don't? It seems natural that these spiritual questions would travel with us in space. Thanks for staying up late to join us, General O'Toole. And thank you, Regman, for stopping by tonight. That completes this brief look at the Newton astronauts. Sometime next year, this group of Earthlings, myself included, will represent our species in the first direct contact with alien intelligence, somewhere inside the extraterrestrial spaceship known as Rama. For IBC, this is Francesca Sabatini. Good night. <laughs>